are here with us for the first time. It seems that uh, every Sunday we get the opportunity to, to greet people and welcome people to this church family. And maybe this is your first time with us at North County. Uh, we're, we're grateful that you're here. We hope you feel welcomed and at home uh, immediately when you start meeting folks here. We're going to begin in praise. Lamentations 3.22 was written in the context of some very dark and difficult times. It had been a time of war and destruction for the people of Jerusalem. They've been taken captive. It, it was written into circumstances that have similarities to the time that we're in as we watch the news and see what's happening in Ukraine and as we pray for the people there and pray for that whole situation. Lamentations 3.22 reminds us that the steadfast love of the Lord never fails. It never ceases, and as we awaken to a new day, as, as the darkness gives way to the dawn, His love is new every morning. So we're going to begin in worship, invite you to open up your hearts and voices and praise God with us. Good morning. Let's all stand and sing a couple songs together. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in Him. Therefore I will hope. God, you are my God, and I will never praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will never praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways. And step by step, you'll lead me. And I will follow you all of my days. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your way. And step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. And I will follow you all of my days, and I will follow you all of my days. And step by step you'll lead me. And I will follow you all of my days. Please be seated. Good morning, church. If you could please bow down your heads with me as we pray. Thank you, God, for this day and allowing us to wake up to this beautiful weather, to this beautiful day, to sit over here and listen to your word, to listen to what you have to say. Please help us understand what you're going to say, what you're going to tell us, and to apply it to our lives, not only today, but every, every teaching that we are to read and hear from you, that we may apply it to our lives and to make other disciples of every nation and to do everything for your glory. Please bless this day and 
Help us to grow closer and closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I love to stand. so good and we're so thankful for you.
Good morning, church. As we prepare for the taking of the Lord's Supper, I want to bring you to a story of Moses and the bronze snake. In Numbers chapter 21, in the middle of the Exodus epic, we see the Israelites develop a chronic grumbling problem as they move from Egypt towards the Promised Land. Despite repeated warnings and punishment for, compla for complaining against God and Moses, God's people continued to belly ache. God's judgment for the sin is found in Numbers 21, verse 6, which states, Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the, the people, and many Israelites died. For an offense that we may see as inconsequential, like grumbling, we see God take the sin so seriously and not skip judgment for that offense. But God's judgment and mercy are inseparable. When you see judgment in his word or feel it in your life, Look deeper. Once flipped over, we see that God's infinite mercy is on the other side of that coin. God delivered judgment for Israelites' complaints, but then he delivered mercy, as we can see him give that mercy in verses 8 through 9, which reads, The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. This wasn't backpedaling or flip-flopping. It was his divine nature on full display. Because he is holy, he must deal with our sin. Because he is love, he chooses to offer us mercy. When the grumbling Israelites looked to the bronze serpent held high on a pole, they were saved from the punishment they deserved. Mercifully, God used the emblem of his judgment to draw his people back to himself. That's good news for them that points to even better news for us. In John chapter uh, 3, verses 15, sorry, verses 14 through 15, we read, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. The Israelites looked to a snake on a pole for healing from a poisonous venom. We looked to the, to the Savior on the cross to heal us from the poison of sin. They were, given an, in, sorry, they were given an injunction against immediate death. We are saved from spiritual death and granted eternal life instead. I don't think the Israelites wanted to fix their eyes on a bronze snake while actual snakes were striking at their heels. But God needed them to look hard at his judgment so they could receive his mercy. Like the Israelites, we are sinners deserving of God's judgment. It's tempting, it's tempting to look away from that truth, but if you just look, his mercy is easy to spot. God uses the cross, the emblem of his judgment, to draw us back to himself. Because of our sin, the cross was, ne was necessary. That's judgment. Yet from the cross, Jesus took the punishment we deserve 
and in his mercy, he overcame the snake and death once and for all. Look past God's servant Moses and see the God who delivers both righteous judgment and loving mercy. Look past the snake on the pole and see the Savior on the cross. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we come to you in prayer, prayer to uh, thank you for another beautiful morning, Lord. We want to thank you for the sacrifice you made up for us uh, on that cross. Um, although we mocked you, spit on you, although our sins put you up on the cross, Lord, we want to thank you for the mercy that you have uh, given us, Lord. Thank you for the light and um, thank you for the truth that you uh, bring us, Lord. And I pray that you may guide us in that truth and light so that we may bring that to others, Lord. I pray that you bless us this morning, Lord, and uh, pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Now that uh, everyone has had the opportunity to take communion, we're going to give you the opportunity to make your offering. Our giving in this church is, is a part of our worship week to week. We praise for giving God our time and our talents, but also our treasure um, so that we can share together in the work that God's doing in the life of the church. Some of you have already given online or the app or uh, perhaps put your uh, offering in the basket earlier, but uh, these brothers are going to pass through the aisles and give you the opportunity to give if you'd like to give now during the, uh, the gathering, during the assembly. Let's stand as we sing Good Good Father. Our Father, we love you and we thank you so much. We thank you so much for giving us our needs. We thank you for your goodness. We pray that you would increase our faith as we think and reflect on the words we're about to sing. We love you and it's in Jesus' name. Amen.
Turn over to Ephesians chapter 1, if you will. Uh, last Sunday morning, we kicked off a series, Who You Say I Am. And we started to think about why our identity is so important. Our sense of purpose, our understanding of our worth and our value, and then even our values and our behavior, our choices and decisions about life are shaped by who we are. I need to make a little adjustment on this. Uh, got too much, too much stuff up here. There we go. Need a little room, get a little comfortable. Um, I knew somebody, a friend, when he was a teen, uh, whose dad would often tell him as he was getting ready to leave the house and go out, maybe with some of his, his buddies, he would always look at him and say, remember who you are. You're A, and then he would say, their last name and by that dad was basically saying out of that sense of identity of who we are as a family that says something about who you are and there are some assumed values rooted in that name remember who you are last Sunday morning we were in 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 where Paul expounds on the idea that now that we're in Christ we no longer see ourselves, and we no longer see others in the same way. Paul said, I used to see Jesus a certain way, but I, I do no longer. And, and now that's changed the way that I see everybody. And now my heart just beats for this ministry of reconciliation. I see every person is needing Christ. And I see myself differently in relationship to Christ. And he speaks about those who take pride in appearance rather than what's in the heart. That's the way of the world in which we're brought up in and nurtured, right? Appearance is very important. External markers that say you're of worth, you have value, you're popular, you're esteemed. And then Paul comes along and says, boy, now that I know the Lord Jesus Christ, God looks at something entirely different and looks at us entirely different than the way the world looks at us and we look at ourselves different. So, in this series, we've been talking about this concern for identity. We're often concerned with what the world says about us, how the world values us, or maybe we're concerned with what our family says about us, or maybe we've been hurt by what an ex has said about us or our peer group, or maybe even our self-talk 
is somewhat defeating when we talk to ourselves about ourselves. So in this particular series, what we're interested in hearing is, you know, God, what is it that you say about me? We sang that song last week, who you say I am. That's what matters most. Now, I want you to do something with me this morning. I want you to close your eyes for just a moment. Don't worry, we're in a Christian crowd. You don't have to grab your wallet or anything. You don't have to think something strange is going to happen to you. Here's what I want you to do. Just close your eyes for a moment. And if you could come up with three or four words of how you honestly see yourself, not, not what you want to be, not what you ought to be, use those words to fill in and finish this statement. I am... How do you fill in the statement? I am kind, caring, important, bright, valuable, strong, gifted, significant, or, or maybe, maybe you fill in that sentence with, I am insignificant, unimportant, broken, inadequate, insecure, a loser, a failure. Open up your eyes. How did you fill in the words of that sentence? How we see ourselves is important and the problem is we all grow up with some warped mirrors that we look into you know what I'm talking about you've all probably been to the Del Mar Fair right and you go into that zone where they have the warped mirrors you look in one of those mirrors and you're 20 feet tall and then you look at another mirror and you're 20 feet wide and you look at another mirror and you're about three foot six you look into these warped mirrors and you get a very distorted image or picture of yourself. It isn't real. You laugh it off because you know that it's not real, right? But the reality is we've all looked into warped mirrors throughout our lives that have given us distorted images of ourselves. Perhaps the mirror that we've looked into when we've heard our family speak has been a little bit warped. I mean, maybe our families, your family, poured good things into you, but maybe some of us came from families where moms and dads or maybe siblings projected things onto us that simply weren't true. Maybe they were projecting their own hurts onto us and saying things to us that cut, that we carried with us throughout our lives. Maybe you were told that you didn't amount to much and you never would. Or maybe you were always being compared with someone who in some particular area of their life seemed to outdo you. Or perhaps we heard things on the playground at school or in the locker room or in the lunch room that kind of served as a warped mirror that gave us a distorted picture of ourselves, and maybe we believed what we saw in that mirror. Maybe it shaped us into the people that we are today. The self-talk, it can drive all sorts of things in our life. The need for approval, the performance or the perfectionist trap, always trying to please others, always trying to excel, to show ourselves to be something. And so we get into these traps of you know, working into the late hours of the night, taking every project and straining everything out of it because we're perfectionists and have this need to please. We need the approval of some people, maybe, we think, that are important in our lives. Or we set out and we live a life of blame since we can never live up to what we think we ought to be, or at least we think. Our self-talk makes us a victim. And so instead of trying to perform, we just spend our lives blaming. Or we tell ourselves, hey, I'll be accepted if. 
Man, if I make a lot of money or I get straight A's or I, I look a certain way or if I get so many likes on social media, so we pose and we take selfies and then we look at the numbers that are racking up and maybe we start to derive our worth, our value from how many people like what we posted. You know, there are certain things that all of us tend to fear. We fear rejection. We learn this early in school. Will we be accepted by this group or that group? Will we be chosen out of the playing field or chosen to have a part in the play? We fear rejection. Maybe it's we fear being rejected by a parent. Maybe some of you had a parent that said early in life, you know, I'm done. I'm, I'm really not interested in being in a family. I want to live life my way. And they left and left you alone. Maybe you're a single parent because somebody stepped out and said, you know, I want something else for my life. And so you felt rejected. We all fear insignificance. We fear that our life in the end won't really matter. And sometimes we wonder, maybe our life doesn't really matter. And if it did matter, Maybe I would not feel so insignificant with others who seem so successful and who seem to be achieving so many things. That can lead us to a life of comparison. Or we all feel harm. We fear harm. We want to be safe. We want to be safe physically. We want to be safe emotionally. We want to live in safe places where we can at least seek to be our authentic selves. And we even fear death. That's a part of the biblical story, right? Fear drives so many of us. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1 for a couple of moments today. And Ephesians 1 is going to help us with this identity crisis that exists in the world. And we're going to be more concerned not with what the world says or what our family says or what our peer group says or even what we say about ourselves, we're going to be more concerned with what it is that God says about each one of us today. And if you're brand new to the Bible, I know that every time we come together, there are folks who are almost brand new, or maybe you've just kind of stepped into the Bible. Let me give you a real brief background into this passage in this book. Ephesus was a major city in Greece where the Apostle Paul had gone and spent several years in really fruitful ministry. And Paul, one of the apostles of Christ, had committed his whole life to going out and making followers of Jesus among Gentile people who for much of their lives, if they were associated with Jews, thought of themselves as excluded from the people of God, or at least those people who believed in that God. And the Jews treated them accordingly. So Paul went out and he taught Gentiles that they could become, in fact, a part of God's people without first becoming Jewish converts and for the men without being circumcised. I'm sure that was good news for them. This didn't make some of the Jewish Christians happy. In fact, it made them very unhappy because they thought of the law of Moses in our old covenant in the Hebrew Bible as binding for all people. And they just couldn't fathom the idea that uncircumcised men and individuals, women, could come in and be a part of the family of God without first having a type of conversion to Judaism and adhering to the law and being circumcised. These people they have been taught all their lives had no place among the people of God. And Paul himself, up until he had been converted to Jesus, he would have thought similarly. He was a Pharisee. He would have thought these people have no place among God's people. But that judgmental spirit changed radically when Paul met Jesus Christ and became a Christ follower. And now he's out preaching Jews and Gentiles alike have a place in the commonwealth of Israel. You can all be sons and daughters of God. And so as Paul writes this letter, he writes it from a Roman prison. And what he's trying to do is preserve a newly forged unity between Jews and Gentiles. And it was a unity forged by the Holy Spirit 
that needed to be maintained. And what he's telling the readers as you read through Ephesians is this. This new unity between Jews and Gentiles is of the Holy Spirit. And this isn't the result of compromise of the truth. This is the result of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Ephesians is an important message. God has brought the two together, Jew and Gentile, and made them one in Christ. And what he's doing is, is he is making a whole new humanity in this new kingdom. And at the same time, in all of this, he wants to fend off any idea of the Gentile Christians becoming prejudiced toward their Jewish brothers and sisters because of these thoughts the Jews have had about them. The thing he's trying to keep from having happen is that there be a Jewish and a Gentile church. So, as you read in Ephesians chapter 1, the letter begins with Paul praising God for what he has done in Christ Jesus. And he's saying, in effect, as you read this, listen, from eternity past, God has planned to plan, he's purpose to purpose, to choose and bless a covenant people. And it all started way back there with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And now he's saying that anyone can be adopted into this family of believers because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, forgiving all of our sins, redeeming us all by the blood of Christ, and removing that barrier that existed between us and God and the barrier that existed between Jew and Gentile. He's saying, in effect, listen, in Jesus, God is bringing unity to all things in heaven and on earth under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, he's asking them to lean in and listen to this. There is now one new people under a new covenant. And he's making the point that God didn't scramble at the last moment to bring this together because many Jews had rejected their Messiah. No, this was his eternal plan all along, his predetermined way. And he chose in advance to create this new humanity, this new people, and save all who would accept Christ. So it is this beautiful story of Scripture that Paul is reminding them of, that from start to finish, God has been planning this and bringing it about. And brothers and sisters, we are in the midst of that story of what God is doing in the world. Isn't that exciting? Doesn't that give you goosebumps? And not just because it's you know about 55 degrees out here this morning. I mean, that is good news. So Paul writes this letter from prison, and what he is writing is of such importance that he doesn't want to wait to get out of prison to go teach this to the Ephesians. So read with me. Look at verse 3 of chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who brings out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will or works out, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. 
And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who were God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now, this is what I want you to hear today. You either are, or you can become, a child of God. You either are, in this crowd today, or you can become a child of God. This was a new thought religiously. You know, for those who were used to looking up at the gods and they thought they were these beings to appease and to please and who looked just at ordinary mortals and saw them in that way, they're learning that, that God, starting with Jesus, teaches us to pray Father. He's a good, good Father and He calls us not to be mere mortals that might be able to eke their way into His presence and please Him. No, we are sons and daughters of God. What a great identity. What does it mean for you and me to be a child of God? Three things that I want you to take away today. And if you've got the notes, you can kind of write these down. If not, maybe put them in your phone. I'd like you to think about them this week. Number one, it means that I am loved by God. Notice at verse four. In love. He predestined us for adoption, to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. I heard about a boy who came home from school and he told his mom and dad about some of the knuckle-headed students on his campus who were teasing him because he was adopted. And his mom had the best answer ever. I love this. She said, you go back to those kids and you tell them that their parents didn't have a choice. They're stuck with them. But you tell them we chose you. As a matter of fact, we pursued, sought you out, and chose you to be our child. Man, I hope he went back to those knuckleheads and said that. Because that radically shifted the way he saw himself. He was chosen. This is the picture, the relationship that Scripture uses to describe our being children of God, and particularly for those of us that are, you know, Gentile believers, adopted into the family of God. And this isn't the only place where we find it. In Galatians 4, at verses 4 to 6, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons and because you were sons God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying Abba father so Paul says it's the same thing for these Jewish believers as well God looked at us and said I, I want those who accept my son I want him in my family and I'll include them in my family. I'll adopt them into my family. I pursued them through Jesus Christ. I love them that much. I want them that much. And I'll make you sons and daughters. All you got to do is accept my invitation. That's how much I love you. You know, adoptions don't happen on accident. Nobody ever says, you know, you know, whoops, we hadn't planned this one. You know, we adopted a child. No, it's intentional. Adoption in the Roman world, they didn't just adopt babies, but grown-ups. As a matter of fact, many in the Roman world were slaves. And it might be that a wealthy person has all this wealth that he doesn't have an heir to give it to. And it might be that he or she would have had a, a slave in their home that was so good and so respected that they might say, you're going to be my heir. I'm going to adopt you. Can you imagine what that meant for a slave who all their life saw their identity as such? This is my place in life. I'm a slave, 
And then this wealthy person says, you're, you're not a slave. No, you're my son. And when I die, all that I have is yours. This is what Paul is saying. This is what God has done with us. He has adopted us into his family and made us sons and daughters. And we're not just called children of God. We actually are. Remember last week, 1 John 3 at verse 1. John said, see what great love the Father has lavished. There's the second time we read the word lavish, right? We read it in Ephesians 1. He's not stingy. He doesn't just dole his love out little measures. See what love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And then, I mentioned to you last week, there's this little Greek phrase there, hi esmen. It's as if John really wants to drive the point home and he says, and that is what we are. Because we hear these phrases, we hear these terms, and then we go off and forget our identity. We listen to the Bible and sometimes we hear these great promises and maybe we don't really take them at face value. So John is saying, I want you to know how much God loves you. He deeply loves you. So much so that he calls us his children. And it's as if John needs to pause and say, and that is what we are. Make no mistake about it. I'd like you to do something else with me. I'd like you to repeat that with me. I, I want you to say with that with me, I am a child of God. Now, if you're not a child of God, you don't need to say it. I'll tell you how to become a child of God in a couple of moments. But if you're a child of God, I want you to say this with me. I am a child of God. That is what we are. Say that with me. That is what we are. I am a child of God. Let's say it again. I am a child of God. That is what we are. Now believe it, brothers and sisters. Go out of here and see yourselves as the sons and daughters of God, deeply loved by God. It's critical to the way we live our lives. Second, it's 11-7, and I need to end this sermon. Didn't I say this last week? I don't want to lose trust with you, but I don't have time to finish this sermon, all right? Um, will you come back next week? All right, can we make a covenant right here? Because we're going to talk about the fact that we're chosen and we're changed, and then we're going to continue this series, and I'm going to set a new schedule for it, because I intended to get this whole sermon out last Sunday. But I think it's worth continuing on this vein, and we'll come back to it next week. I do want to say this, though. Read in advance. This is such a, a precious identity that is ours, but one of the things we'll talk about this week, maybe you're sitting here wondering, Kevin, you said some of us may not be children of God. We're all the offspring of God, Paul said. We were all created by him and in his image. But John, in John chapter 1, points out that those to whom Jesus initially went, his own people, many rejected him. But to those who received him, Scripture says, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of a natural birth, not because a mom and dad decided to have a baby, but it's a spiritual birth, and in John chapter 3, he gets at what this new birth is, and he says, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again, born of water and the Spirit. So I didn't want to leave you hanging on that one, and if you're here today and you're thinking, I'd, I'd like to have this identity, I'd like to be a child of God, I'd, I'd like to have this redemption, this forgiveness that is found by the blood of Jesus Christ, we never want a person to leave our gatherings without knowing how they can become a child of God or at least being able to have a conversation with it or about it. So if you want to talk to me after that, I'd love to talk with you or one of our elders, but I'll elaborate on that more next week and we'll continue this series about who God says I am. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this beautiful day and for allowing us to meet here today. Thank you for loving us and for being a great father. 
I pray that you guide us to become good servants and children of you. Um, bless each of us and keep us safe until we're able to gather together again. In your name we pray. Amen.